Hi everyone! A pleasant afternoon. Welcome to Hashtag One With You, the PLDT Enterprise Virtual Industry Forum for the Manufacturing Industry. My name is Mike Nolasco from PLDT Enterprise One Luzon, and it is my honor to be your host for this online forum. To all those who are already tuned in, we truly appreciate your time to be with us today as we share views and insights from our industry representatives and speakers that we have today. This afternoon, amidst this pandemic, we will get to hear relevant data from our keynote speakers from Global Data and PLDT Enterprise. We are also fortunate to have with us today a roster of distinguished panelists representing, rep representing the manufacturing industry to discuss key learnings and experiences as well as share best practices on how different companies has managed to mitigate the negative impact of this crisis situation. Most importantly, this session aims to highlight the role of technology as we enter the future of work as well as how we navigate through our daily lives. For those who will have any questions, suggestions, and thoughts you would like to share later, feel free to share them in our chat box that you can see on your screen. Before we begin, here's a quick rundown of our reminders. For an interrupted viewing experience, make sure you have a stable internet connection. Feel free to use any device to view the virtual event. For better appreciation, turn up the volume or use your headphones. And now, to officially start the program, our first presenter is a highly respected equity analyst from the investment banking sector. He has studied the technology, media, and telecom sector for the last 25 years. He leads the development of Global Data's thematic research ecosystem, a single integrated platform for looking at all themes impacting all companies all sectors, across all sectors. Here to share with us the latest data on the impact of the coronavirus on the global economic landscape, the significant effects on international economic and trade activities, and global insights that will help various industries respond, thrive, and recover amidst the crisis. Please welcome on your screen, Global Data PIC's Head of Thematic Research, Mr. Cyrus Mebowala. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for inviting me uh, to your webinar, your PLDT webinar. Uh, my name is Cyrus Mebowala. I'm head of thematic research at Global Data. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about manufacturing. Now, manufacturing is a, a very broad sector, so I'm going to focus on the impact of COVID-19 on the automotive sector, uh, which is indicative of the broader manufacturing uh, trends. Now, the damage to automotive industry revenues will be greater, we think, than in the 2007-2008 uh, financial crisis. On the supply side, most production plants in Europe and North America still remain closed until the end of April. We estimate $131 billion of lost revenues to OEMs, car makers, in North America and Europe alone. And that assumes a return to production in May. If production is laid, uh, delayed, uh, then those losses will be bigger. Concerns over demand are surfacing too. Car ownership was already heading for decline in a world of Uber cab shares. Uh, lockdowns further reduce the need for cars. Looking ahead, sustainability is the big theme concern concerning customers. But with oil prices at $20 a barrel, it's much more difficult to make the investment case for consumers to switch to electric vehicles. No part of the automotive value chain will be undamaged uh, in the short term. If you look at vehicle manufacturing, they've seen a devastating impact as factories have shut down. How fast they open will determine whether the recession will be U-shaped or V-shaped for the, for the car industry. Car dealerships remain largely closed. Since new car sales comprise 90% of dealership revenues, they will be hit hard too. Auto parts makers are largely beholden to the OEMs, and their troubles may be amplified if their car-making customers do not settle bills on time. 
In terms of new mobility technologies, such as autonomous driving or shared mobility or electric vehicles, coronavirus will delay their arrival. Take car sharing. General Motors announced on the 21st April, just a couple of days ago, it will shut down Maven, its car sharing brand, on virus transmission fears. Take autonomous driving. If car sharing does not exist, the need for autonomous cars also falls. And then take electric vehicles. Low oil prices and a recession will make investment in new electric vehicles much less attractive. In the after sales market, things such as vehicle servicing, these things tend to benefit in a recession as people delay buying new cars but are willing to pay more to repair or service their existing car instead. So what are the medium to longer term impacts on the automotive industry value chain? For auto component makers, de-risking the supply chain means less globalization, and it also means higher automation. For car makers themselves, expect to see onshoring of production, a more diverse supply chain, less just-in-time management, and much higher levels of automation. For the sales and marketing functions of car makers, expect to see increased spend on advertising, a flurry of new promotions in the medium term. In the end market, the customer who's, who's buying the car, consumers want more connectivity in their car and they want more uh, sustainable means of transport. In the after sales market, expect to see several goodwill initiatives and a flurry of promotions and incentives. Now at Global Data, we've revised our sales forecast for the global light vehicle sales market, um, and we brought it down to 75.2 million units in 2020. This means that we expect sales to fall 16.2% in 2020 from 2019 numbers. Uh, and that sets the global light vehicle industry back to sales, level we last, sales levels last seen in 2011, almost 10 years ago. Now note that these estimates for 2020 sales volumes, uh, you know, from us and from all industry experts, well, the, expert, the, the estimates from all industry experts range from about 64 million on the low side, this is 2020 sales, to 78 million on the high side, we're 75 million. And the key assumption that we all make for these forecasts is when will this crisis end? And of course, nobody knows the answer to that. In quarter one of this year, sales of light vehicles worldwide fell to 16.7 million units, and that was about 15% below our base case scenario. In quarter two, the figures are going to look much worse because production has already ground to a halt in most countries outside of China uh, in April, and many dealerships are still closed. So we expect a 44% decline in sales in quarter two of 2020, compared with the same quarter in 2019. By quarter four of this year, we expect sales to rise sharply, however. Our main assumption again is that production will resume in May. Now this chart shows how the decline in light vehicle sales worldwide is spread across the main geographical markets. Overall, as we mentioned earlier, we expect the global light vehicle market to fall from 89.8 million units in 2019 to 75.2 million units in 2020. Western Europe will see a decline of around 3.7 million units, making it the biggest loser. China will be the second biggest loser with a fall of 3.3 million units. And North America will see a fall of 2.9 million units in 2020. In mid-March 2020, many Chinese car plants reopened, just as American and European plants were shutting down. So studying the Chinese market will help us predict how other markets will respond when lockdowns are loosened. In January 2020, Chinese car sales fell 33%. In Feb 2020, they fell 92% in the first half of that month. But by the end of March, footfall in car showrooms in China was nearly back to pre-crisis levels. US light vehicle sales fell 38% in March compared to a year ago. In April, we, forecast, we had forecast two weeks ago that they would fall 82%, but now we've revised that fall to just 51%. In May, 
we expect U.S. sales to fall 37% compared to a year ago. But then we see a pickup in sales in the last quarter of 2020, with December sales forecast to be 15% higher than in December last year. In Europe, light vehicle sales fell 46% in March. We expect European light vehicle sales to decline 20% for the whole of 2020 compared to 2019. The weakest markets in Europe will be Germany, France, and Italy. Now, this chart shows the exposure of the major OEMs to Europe, North America, and China, the three big car markets likely to see the biggest uh, sales declines in 2020. So the OEMs most at risk based on their exposure to these three big markets are Volkswagen and General Motors. The least exposed to three, these three big markets, all of which are expected to see the, highest sale, the, 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 the biggest decline in sales, are Suzuki and Mitsubishi. So what does this all mean for the big automotive players? So this slide shows our thematic scores for the COVID-19 theme. A score of one, which is colored red, means that we believe COVID-19 will have a significant negative financial impact on this company over the next 12 months. A score of two, which is orange, means it will have an, a moderate negative uh, financial impact. So as you can see, there's no green, which is a score of five on this page, implying that there, there are no winners in 2020 in the automotive sector. As governments begin to loosen lockdowns and the world's factories go back to work, manufacturers will have to prepare for a completely new world. This means a greater focus on technology. It means factories that can operate with fewer workers. It means supply chains that are more diversified. And it means onshoring of some critical production. You're looking now at Global Data's 2020 theme map for the manufacturing sector. And this theme map shows the big themes keeping manufacturing chief executives awake at night. Clearly, COVID-19 is the biggest theme impacting the manufacturing sector today. But tomorrow's successful manufacturers will focus on the technology themes on this theme map, and they will also have to focus on the biggest theme occupying end consumers' minds today, which is sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Cyrus. Well, um, listening to your report is quite frightening to the manufacturing uh, industry especially for cars and I'm sure uh, the same charts or statistics are, are being experienced also by other uh, companies uh, in the manufacturing sector. Uh, we could just hope that uh, there, these companies would still be able to have the chance to recover after uh, this pandemic. Mm. Anyway, um, for our second speaker, as uh, he has been with PLDT Group for 19 years and managed key verticals such as IT, BPO, banking and financial institution, retail and manufacturing, conglomerates, and among others. In 2010 to 2012, he was given a concurrent position of president and CEO for PLDT Clark Tell and PLDT Subic Tell, two of PLDT's subs and affiliates while managing the PLDT Enterprise North Luzon portfolio. He is currently part of the PLDT Enterprise leadership team. To share with us some insights today on the manufacturing industry, as well, on, as, well as on the technology and the solutions this industry can leverage on uh, to help mitigate the negative impact of the pandemic, please welcome Corporate Relationship Management Head, mm. Mr. Dennis Magbatok. Dennis? Thank you, Mike. A pleasant afternoon to all. Um, this is indeed a good uh, virtual session as we all learn and learn and relearn some insights on the effect of COVID-19 pandemic specific to the manufacturing sector. Allow me to start by providing a brief landscape of this industry so that we'll have a singular perspective. These manufacturing companies are actually scattered 
across the Philippines. And the bigger chunk of that is concentrated in Luzon, particularly in Cavite, Laguna, Batangas, and Metro Manila. And that's Region 4A, the region that is most badly hurt by this pandemic as far as lost productivity is concerned. A major subset and main driver is the semicon and electronics industry that contributes 40 billion US dollars annual export revenue. And these are located inside the industrial park and eco zones, 40 of which are in Luzon. This industry provides direct and indirect jobs to around 4 million Filipinos. Now, what were the direct effects of the pandemic? Can you move on the next slide? What were the direct effects of the pandemic to this industry? One is the temporary closure of businesses. In Cavite alone, PESA suspended the business operations inside Cavite Export Processing Zone 1 and 2 affecting 400 plus companies. An average of 20 to 30% of locators inside an industrial park continued operations, but on a limited workforce. Second, logistics slowed down due to the controlled operation of shipping goods in Luzon territory. Third, the strict social distancing in the production floor and assembly area forced companies to run on skeletal workforce. Fourth, employees had a major challenge on public transportation, resulting again to minimum workforce. And last, for some companies, they had in IT intra and availability as they had to rush the implementation of work from home mode. During this pandemic, and more so after this pandemic, one thing is very evident. Technology plays a huge role as we all go forward. So what's the new norm? One, continuity of work from home mode. This is where the robust fiber infra of PLDT plus the LTE network of smart could help. Aside from this, our cybersecurity solutions will be equally important in supporting remote work access. Number two, face-by-face -face skeletal workforce. It will certainly not fool 100% once ECQ is lifted. From the current 25%, um, maybe most companies will increase its plant and office workforce to around 40% and max at 50%. Number three, new health and safety protocols will surely be implemented to balance production and employee safety. Sample would be an additional investment on CCTV and probably on video monitoring system. If there's a new norm, which is somehow for short term and mid term, I'd like to emphasize the future norm. And I'm hopeful that we can get more insights on this. So what about the future norm? This industry may accelerate its digital transformation and technology innovation, part of which is to embark on the 4.0 industrial revolution. We at PLDT and SMART have taken it upon ourselves to be at the forefront of this revolution. 5G, IoT or Internet of Things, use of drones, robotics, and artificial intelligence will certainly help the manufacturing companies in fulfilling a fully automated line assembly processes. We're beginning to see IoT in its earliest forms today. And at the rate that we're going, such technology will transform our society and bring us closer to the fourth industrial revolution. And to show full support to this industry, PLDT Enterprise is working with Dan Lachica and SAPI on the rollout of 5G inside industrial parks and manufacturing ecozones. We've already, we've already identified a few where we will conduct proof of concept. On my last note, which is still part of the future norm, 
we've been hearing about smart city or safe city for others. Maybe we can extend that into the manufacturing environment. Sooner or later, we could uh, probably see and experience a what we call smart factory or even a smart industrial park. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Dennis. Um, all of us could just really hope that these tools and technologies could help manufacturing companies to be able to slowly recover after this uh, pandemic. And uh, because um, a lot of people are also dependent on this industry, uh, especially a million of Filipinos are actually depending on this industry for their employment. Again, thank you to all our keynote presenters. Those were very good insights. And now we have to move on the next part of the program with our guest speakers who will share their view on the earlier presentations after this short video. I'd like to introduce our esteemed roster of panelists who are also live with us this afternoon and will be joining in today's inside sharing. First up from our guests is currently the country manager of Microchip Technology Operations Corporation in the Philippines and an, an esteemed member of the Board of Trustees of CP or the Semiconductor and Electronics Industries in the Philippines Incorporated, Mr. Greg Fisher. Can you share your thoughts or reactions from what were presented earlier, Greg? Yes, first of all, thanks for having me here today. Um, I think that most of us have business continuity plans already in place, and that's where we sit around with our executive staff and we do a what-if analysis, and we write down all the different things that we can think of to prepare in the case of disasters that may happen, and we review these uh, at least once a year to add new things as they may pop up, but in no, no one's planning really did we expect to have an infectious disease any worse than what we previously had experienced back around 18 years ago with SARS. So our business continuity planning was a little limited in terms of infectious diseases. For example, um, had we been able to predict or plan for an epidemic or pandemic as bad as this, we would have more laptops instead of desktops. We would have more uh, perhaps um, printers and scanners available to our people at home. We would uh, maybe subsidize internet connections so that when we encounter this school from home and, and all these people working from home, you know, we're choking down the bandwidth right now. I know my two kids yeah. are doing Zoom for school the same time I'm doing Teams and WebExes, and it's, it's choking me down a lot, and I'm not the only one. So if we had been able to think of a pandemic of this scale, then we could have prepared a little bit better. And I think primarily the change from desktop, desktops to laptops would have helped a lot. We had to really scramble to prepare for working at home to get the desktops out of the factory in some cases and others to get scanners, printers, you know, engineers, they like their multiple monitors on their desks. So we had to go in a second day and get more things, the peripherals. So we've learned a lot from this on how to plan for an event like this again. We actually... Uh, had a lot of uh, learning from the tall eruption. It really taught us to be prepared with provisions. We had already purchased emergency bedding, uh, personal and hygiene items, canned goods, dry goods, foods of that type that really helped us in this pandemic because we were able to use those provisions for our skeletal crew that just came in. Okay, so I think that Business continuity is going to have a huge focus when everybody returns um, back to work and we start the, the new norm. I, I know that we're really, we're really going to extend the ability to work from home um, as long as people can still effectively provide value doing so. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, this situation has... Uh, pushed all of us to really learn a lot in terms of preparation. I think most of the companies today are, are uh, doing a lot of things 
to make sure that they are able to uh, somehow uh, continue to operate at this time and uh, be able to be ready to operate in the future in case something similar, hopefully not, that could happen in the future. Yeah. Right. And especially in the manufacturing sector where there was a volcano eruption sometime in January, right? Uh, somehow, right. As, as small uh, preparations has been made, but uh, again, nobody was expecting that this magnitude or scale of uh, disaster would happen, which affects everyone globally. Um, maybe we could also get uh, the view of our uh, next speaker. We have with us from On Semiconductor Philippines, General Manager, Ms. Lilith Montaire, live from On, Semi, On Semicon Cebu office. Ms. Lilith? Hello, good afternoon. This is Lilith Montaire, the Director, yeah, Director and General Manager of On Semiconductor Cebu Philippines. So, first of all, for the automotive uh, industry, it's really sad to see that uh, you know it's going to be going down but we have expected that and yes it will impact our overall revenue because that's about 25 percent of our total revenue as a on semi for on semiconductor corporation in terms of the uh, covid 19 crisis yes we were also having the the normal business continuity plan, which we review like most of the semiconductor industries. And we do have a lot of things in place. For example, um, maybe unlike the previous speaker, Greg, um, our site is lucky that we were two years ahead in implementing a uh, use of laptops instead of desktops in our offices, especially for those who are support groups for manufacturing. So when we enable the work from home or the flexible work from home, the only challenge that we saw there was the internet speed because um, we not, all, not everybody had their own uh, Wi-Fi at their respective homes. That was the, the first challenge. But the tools um, like laptops and cell phones, we were able to provide that to most of our employees that are eligible to work from home, especially our engineers. And in terms of the preparation for the facility, yes, nobody really prepared for COVID-19 uh, crisis. Nobody anticipated this or probably not took seriously what happened um, last part of the quarter of 2019 when this was first um, reported. However, we are foreseeing really a new norm, which we are now implementing in all our facilities. And we are preparing our own playbook as far as the safety, health, and sanitation protocols for our sites. Um, that's for the reefer fabs and uh, assembly and test operations. Um, aside from what we have already installed for business continuity, where we have buffer inventories in our distribution, centers, safety stocks for critical materials and uh, al alternate routes for shipments, I think the new norm would be to really go over and beyond what we have already established right now. So yes, we will be affected, but um, my reaction would be to the first presenter is the electric vehicles in China is um, really ramping up. Do you feel that uh, it will it will not ramp up as fast as the rest of the countries because of the fuel? That was what was presented. But what we're seeing in our demand, fortunately, we saw some uh, increase from prior to the COVID or the ECQ uh, lockdowns that happened in various countries. So where we were before ECQ, we saw a 10% increase in our demand. However, operating at 40 to 60% skeletal workforce is really, really a major challenge for us to support that demand. Thank you, Ms. Lilith. Um, it was good to know that uh, somehow 
on semi has done some preparations already although uh, from what you have said uh, manuf- uh, car manufacturing industry alone affects already 25% of your business which is really a lot uh, 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 and that's not withstanding with the other industries that might uh, affect also uh, in terms of uh, business slowdown might affect also the ongoing business of one semi in terms of providing uh, materials and parts and chips to power their technology um, and uh, j- to, to introduce um, our third reactor uh, last but not the least maybe we could get some point of view uh, not from the manufacturing companies itself uh, the estate director of Carmen Ray Industrial Park 2 or CIP2 Mr. Pedi Palumar. Sir, Pedi, your thoughts, please. Maybe we could get some views and insights coming from the uh, park locator, uh, park uh, managers naman. Yep. Sir, Pedi? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, wait, I don't have my... No, wala. I think... Uh, there you go. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yep. Uh, after Taal, uh, the park face really a, you know, a different challenge right now. However, we survived simply because we have improved and exert effort in terms of communication. And I think uh, we need a very good connection because we have been managing uh, remotely and we have to report and monitor as well. So these virtual meetings are really good indication that we can communicate well with people below and the one above. So even our directions now are given through virtual meetings. Then... Uh, as we develop uh, this communication system, we must have a reliable one. Uh, our instructions must be clear. The messages should be fully understood. And in effect, this will also give us a better understanding of the situation. This will allay fears, stop the gossip, and of course, uh, it will avoid fake news. So the communication is very important and vital in our organization, both for our park locators and the park itself. Uh, We have to constantly communicate uh, those who are uh, in the field and especially with other entities. On collaboration, another point of management is that we have to collaborate with task groups We have collaborated also with local government units who are managing the checkpoints. And I think that was the main problem that we encountered during this uh, pandemic uh, situation. Uh, We have to collaborate with them because policies are not well communicated in downstream. So that's the main problem that we face as, as an operator and as well as our locators who are transporting our people. Uh, The community, in terms of community, we have to be friendly with them. We must set an example so that they will know that our locators will follow and comply with government uh, uh, rules or government laws. So so we must comply with them and be friendly with them. But, and lastly, we became more compassionate with people. We have to understand uh, employees, we have to understand their needs. Uh, we have to give them some subsidy. So in effect, all in all, these four guidelines that management has been giving us help us in managing and surviving during this situation. I, thank you, Sir Pedi. I that's all. Thank you. Yes, Mike. yes sir. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I, I took some uh, words from you, like uh, to be compassionate or uh, to, mm. to to give more compassion to people, right? Uh, especially yeah. 
um, it is really important that there are still ways that our uh, employees are still able to do their work because right a job is important for them and uh, it pro- it's it's what provides for their family on a day-to-day basis if if i may ask sir pedi so all of your team now are work from home no uh, definitely the maintenance and operate operations group are still operating regularly Right. But because we have very few people, for example, in the water and wastewater, which is yeah. the main utilities for our park, mm-hmm. uh, there are few people there. So we could um, actually we have been asking them to stay in, a, in the area. So wow. they are not going on for, for, for quite some time now. So they are a sort of a quarantine in the work area also for the maintenance group. We have a very few of them, about 30 of them. So we were we find a place for them where they could, you know. Uh, sleep, a sleeping quarter in their play in their area. So with that, they are also isolated from, you know, from the uh, daily routine of you know, passing by to other areas. Okay, so you uh, you're actually monitoring what uh, everything that is happening th- from from your home, no? Correct. Your, uh, no? Correct. Correct. <laughs> Just like what <laughs> yes, said, exactly. it is, Yeah, it is now more important to use uh, technologies, uh, especially the uh, CCTV cameras in, in place. So yes. even if you're not uh, in the office, you're, you'll be able to monitor your uh, uh, techno parks. That's why I, 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 we are so excited when, you, when Dennis mentioned about the 5G. I hope <laughs> it could be in okay. the park. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. We, we try to do our best. Yeah. Okay, sir. Um, thank you to our guests for your invaluable insights. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed to our Q&A segment in a few moments after this short video. Key in your questions, comments, and suggestions via the chat. And we are back again. To everyone who are tuned in by our live streaming in YouTube, again, please join us and be part of the discussion by sending us your questions via our chat box that you can see on your screen. Um, for our Q&A session, uh, first question, maybe I can uh, direct this to you, Greg. Uh, given the ECQ and social distancing protocols, Forced unto us by the COVID-19 pandemic, people working at home and businesses have had to depend on tools or technology to ensure that businesses such as manufacturing companies to be able to continue production and operations. With this, how do you see manufacturing companies adapting or implementing automation such as AI, robotics, or IoT? And um, how do you see these technologies would be able to complement with your existing workforce. Okay. Well, I think that these kinds of projects, when you talk about undertaking a smart manufacturing project, that's that's not going to be motivated by this uh, pandemic. This is just a okay. this is a, a very acute event that's occurring in the life of of our factory and of the country. What really drives the um, the desire to go into smart manufacturing project is the constant dissatisfaction that factory management always has. We always have a chip on our shoulder that things aren't mm-hmm. as good as they could be. We're not as consistent as we want to be. Our yields aren't as good as we want them okay. to be. We still have you know, standalone systems that need some level of interfacing and connectivity to communicate better to each other so that we can get better mm-hmm. quality and better predictability of uh, things like maintenance as well as product quality. So these projects take literally years to do. Um, Some of it is done with commercial solutions, but ultimately there's a lot of customization that you do with people um, inside your own factory. You do in-house. And some of that, even right now, that in-house 
um, interfacing between systems. Those those coders can still do that work while working from home. So that's that's a good thing. And in some cases, they're not being constantly bothered by people coming in their offices and asking for things and tapping them on the shoulder. Um, we're running about 40% of our, our workforce in a skeleton crew right now, but we're getting about 80% the output. And when the headquarters asks me why, I say because management and engineering is not interfering with production. We're just letting them them run. So a smart manufacturing project, I don't think is going to come out of this pandemic. It's not going to be a response okay. from this. Delayed, surely, but not stopped. People are going to get back and continue where they left off. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Um, it's good to hear that we currently we are not highly dependent on this uh, technology yet uh, in terms of uh, being able to continue to operate normally. Um, and um, if, if I may do a follow up question, Greg, do you think there are uh, companies already ready to uh, implement such technologies? as of the moment? Greg? Hello, Greg. Okay. Um, thank you, Greg. Um, it, it's it's a good insight uh, in, in terms of how companies are, are looking at this, maybe not in the short term, but uh, are, are still uh, interested to continue to adopt these kind of technologies. For our next question, if I may address this to you, Ms. Uh, Lily. Yes, uh, what, Yeah, what do you think are the difficulties uh, your companies or manufacturing companies are experiencing for that matter, with regards to the supply chain. After all, all companies or manufacturing companies are highly dependent on, on supply, especially with, with all these checkpoint implementations where only essential goods are allows, allowed to pass quickly on uh, their checkpoints. And uh, how do you think uh, the te some technologies or tools that could help address challenges in, in terms of better management of your supply chain? Okay, the biggest uh, hurdle and challenge that we have experienced during this COVID-19 crisis affecting supply chain is really uh, bringing in the skeletal workforce to operate our manufacturing facility. Definitely the lockdowns, including the restrictions, have you know, stalled and uh, disrupted the supply chain globally. For semiconductor manufacturing, I believe, like on semiconductor, we do have our business continuity plan in place. So to name a few, for us, we do have buffer inventories in our distribution centers. That's about 10 weeks worth of inventory. For materials or critical materials, we do have four to six safety stock, four to six weeks safety stock uh, inventory in our facility. And for shipments, we do have alternate routes. However, all this may not be, you know, enough to mitigate the risk of supply. And considering that the lockdowns are being extended without clear guidance or approach on how we can resume to 100%, then it's really going to be a big challenge for the supply chain as it continues to extend. Um, needless to say, automation and um, robotics are the key enabling technologies that we need to really look into seriously to make our lines fully automated and integrated in order to mitigate this risk at manufacturing standpoint. Now, however, Please note that not all manufacturing industries are able to forego the labor intensive processes simply for two reasons. First, the high cost to implement and second, the product complexity. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lilith. Um, you've, you've also mentioned about uh, AI, robotics and automation that 
and how would be able to help in managing your supply chains better. Maybe I could go back to the question uh, to the follow up question I, I mentioned to Greg earlier, and maybe you could also help to answer. Um, do you think uh, there are already companies, especially here in the Philippines, or manufacturing companies who are ready or are already in the stage of adapting to automation using AI, robotics, or IoT? Uh, yes, we've known some companies who have already adopted so there's that. several. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Greg. I'm sorry, I got knocked off the call. <laughs> Not sure where we're at. Yes, Greg, uh, if, if you can answer oh, okay. first. Okay, I just wanted to add, um, I caught the last part of what Lilith said about the cost to adopt some of the technology and she's that's a thing that we talk about a lot because on one hand we have the fiscal responsibility to our shareholders to always be improving on the other hand we have a responsibility um, the pressures of employment are high especially in this part of Southeast Asia so you have to balance the solutions that you put in place so you can meet both of those and tick both boxes at the same time so there are companies here that are embarked on smart manufacturing projects. There's a bunch of seminars, a couple, couple every every year, maybe four or five at different locations where companies get together and they work with organizations like Mesa on putting together um, roadmaps and discussing what, who's doing what, what's working for who, what solutions are commercially available, and it's really just a meeting of like-minded individuals that have a common mindset of uh, moving their factories along the different phases of achieving smart manufacturing. I think um, most companies, you know, most semiconductor and electronic companies are already at a factory 3.5. You know, when we talk about five. the four, <laughs> yeah, when we talk about the four phases of the industrial revolution, we talk about um, water and steam being the first, and we talk the second being electricity. When you think of like all the manufacturing in the New England area back in the 1870s and 1880s, and then in the 1970s, we have programmable logic controllers and SCADA systems first came out. So computer integrated manufacturing or CIM, is the third phase, the fourth is really what we're talking about now, cyber, cyber physical systems. So I think that semiconductors and electronics due to the, the technologies, you know, we're making the components that go into the technology so we're using a lot of that technology to help make our own components. We have a high degree of uh, robotics already. We're using MES tracking systems. We're leveraging ERP and inter ERP interfacing into uh, part data, master data into the MES systems. Our equipment is already connected. It's already smart and intelligent. Uh, it's controlled with workstations. We're collecting that data. We're analyzing that data. We have a statistical analysis software. We're doing all this as regular um, standard operating procedures. So that's why I say we're already, our industry, and most of the CEPI members are industry, probably industry 3.5. It's taking that last half step to get all the way to 4.0 with more, more sensors and actuators, more levels of software interfacing together where you know you can bring in the planning systems, uh, bring in the material resource planning, uh, production control, your inventory, um, the computer uh, maintenance schedules through a computer uh, CMMS system. When, when do you have that downtime happening? And then using the analytics to do predictive maintenance instead of let it run till it breaks and then fix it kind of mindset, right? and predictive product quality versus we don't know what we're going to get from batch to batch, right? There's, if you collect this data and analyze it, then you can, you can help predict the way things are going to happen in your factory. And the goal is uh, consistency. You want to improve the cycle time. You want to improve your yield. You want to improve your on-time delivery performance, uh, equipment uptime, decrease all those downtimes. And uh, just that's, that's the promise of smart manufacturing. And thank you. Thank you, Greg. How about from your end, Ms. Lily? Ms. Lily? Um, yes, uh, we are already um, preparing or shall we say we have programs for our industry 4.0. And in terms of automation and integration of some of our lines, uh, some of our factories uh, in China are already doing that. And Example, our material handling where we use an artificial intelligence to move parts from one area to another that's already implemented in some of our sites. And we are about to implement that in our sites here in the Philippines as well. 
Um, another example for robotics where we are using it is uh, for conventional molds. So instead of uh, having people doing the conventional molds for some packages that really requires higher tonnage in um, mold, molding processes, uh, that's already a proven uh, concept and being done in some of our sites. So we are also preparing that in aggressively looking into uh, shifting the direction to pull in the automation and integration of our line. Now, for the workforce, I understand that uh, Asia Pacific is really, uh, we have to balance employment. So what we're doing is, what we're doing right now in the aspect of workforce is that most of our people, we have already put up a programs where our people will be shifted from a purely operators to mm -hmm. a technically adept right. workforce that can sustain a um, full integrated and automated line. So we have that prepared already when we started embarking on um, online systems. So we, when we use Camstar for MES, we do away with all the papers and everything has to be online. So pretty much on semiconductor is there going towards a smart uh, facility. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lilith. Um, at least there are still exciting things that we can look for. Yes, definitely, for semiconductor manufacturing. To, uh, 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 yeah. And uh, we'll probably have how to uh, have to figure out how to uh, meet that gap of 3.5. How to uh, help manufacturing companies to bring you to to, to for that mm. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lilith and uh, Greg. Maybe we could uh, ask another question also from the perspective of uh, the locator managers, uh, Sir Pedi. Uh, this is actually for you. Uh, what do you yep. think are the new guidelines going back to how uh, park managers are managing uh, uh, the, the premises now? Uh, what are the new guidelines and safety protocols have you implemented at CIP2 since uh, there had been several mentions of employee safety, mm -hmm. right? And how do you monitor essential workers within the park? Yeah. Um, the, the, we, what we have done is we just implement what the DOH has recommended. Number one, we have, before you, uh, all employees entering the, the park are being thermoscan. So we have okay. thermoscanner right in the gate, and then we ensure that they use face mask. Okay. Right. At the work area, at the locator side, they are again checked and provided with the protective equipment necessary. Now, this will be a new challenge for manufacturing right. after, after May 15, because um, it, the, they have to rewrite their own health and safety procedures. This will be totally a new protocol. You know, we have to do, uh, we have to reshape the work area. That's now number one because of social yeah. distancing. And then we have to change the attitude of people. Bawal na, bawal talaga matigas ang ulo dito, di ba? So this, these are the things that we have to face. The, and in this, in the process, this will be very expensive for our locators to do, to do these things. But you know, health is more important than the business, you know? And then one particular cost that will hit them is the social distancing inside shuttle buses because it will be double now mm -hmm. because the load of each shuttle bus will now be half only to initiate the social distancing as well as in the work area. So we will be facing, you know, a lot of thinking, a lot of ideas that we have to do in the, in the floor area. We have to innovate the area. We have, in, we have to think of other systems so that we could implement the social distancing that is needed while we, have, we still have this, this pandemic or the, we have the, this disease or this virus. Uh, 
as you know, isolation. Another point is the dormit or system could be well implemented in some areas, but not all. Because you can house them inside a certain area or let's say in a park, but it can only accommodate, let's say, 5% of the whole the whole population. Right now, the population that we have in the park is approximately 20% of our of the regular force. This skeletal force that we have is only about 20%. And still, there are a lot of shuttles that we have to do from point to point because as much as possible, there should be no contact other than the employees themselves. So these are the challenges that we will be facing right after May 15. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is... I'm sorry. Yep. No, it's okay. I, I just was about to say this is only over and above the regular requirement of, as recommended by the Department of Health and the task force. So I think we really have to, we'll be facing this one. The home for, um, work from home is still in being implemented. That's good for all the office workers. And to some, it's good. But we cannot do it all. So maybe they will be reporting maybe um, a shortened days, not necessarily a shortened hours, but shortened days maybe yeah. in a way. Okay. Okay. That's all. Thank you, Sir Pedi. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope there could be some technologies or some sort of automation or probably we could also build a roadmap for Technopark for that also. We could alleviate the challenges that you are facing today. Yeah, correct. <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's quite different really because the yeah. work area, uh, the work area that they have now was designed for so many people and then you reduce it to half. So it will be, you know, a lot of innovation, a lot of thinking that this uh, engineers and this management will have to do in the work area. They have to really reshape it. There should be a lot of reshaping, not only on the, on the floor area, but rather on the attitude of the people also. Okay. Thank you, Sir Pedi. Uh, very well said. Thank you, too. Um, Thank you. We, we have a few minutes left. Maybe we could uh, pick up some questions from our um, audiences. Uh, and any of our panels could probably give your thoughts or answer to this. Um, this is, uh, let me pick up one of the questions. Um, in your opinion, will there be certain systems or processes that will become outdated uh, upon, the lifting, uh, upon uh, the lifting of EC or probably when this um, and there, is there any that uh, companies or manufacturing companies are, are going to outdate already and uh, go to the, what uh, some of you have said, go to the new norm. Anyone from the panel? Uh, I'll make uh, one, one point, it's Cyrus here, which is that, you know, uh, as an equity analyst, I've studied for four decades and I've seen four recessions and the companies in manufacturing that come out of recessions fastest, fastest are the ones that are really tech enabled before they go in. So my advice to somebody, to any manufacturing company, you know, it's too late for this pandemic, but for the next pandemic or for the next crisis, no matter what the crisis is about, tech enable your business. And you mentioned all the tech right enable. things from on semi and so on, IoT, cloud, AI, and so on. But the more tech enabled you are, you just look at any industry, look at Netflix and TV, Amazon and e-commerce, Tesla in the car industry, mm -hmm. the tech enabled companies are going to come out of this crisis better. Thank you, Cyrus. Anyone else from the panel? Maybe Greg, Lily. Okay. Um, let, let me get another question be, uh, before we uh, bef before it's time to have this uh, online forum. Uh, maybe I'll ask I'll pick this question. So since automation. Uh, uh, robotics and IoT are also dependent on communication, but maybe Dennis could answer this uh, first. 
uh, internet is a primary drive for telecommuting and IoT. How can PLDT and smart provide stable and reliable internet connectivity across the Philippines? Dennis? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, picking up from the speakers, from all the speakers, it's very evident that the uh, industry um, has already been using the advanced technology on IoT and even going into the 4.0 um, industry revolution. Um, what's interesting to note is that uh, PLD10 Smart has already stepped forward, okay? And we have a handful of manufacturing companies uh, that is already um, working with us in doing proof of concept for IoT, for 5G, uh, for um, um, other uh, advanced technologies. For PLDT and SMART, um, we have continually um, earmarked um, and invested on uh, both on fiber and even on our um, um, wireless network. Uh, by the end of the year, we will be um, experiencing a faster connectivity, may it be via the wireless uh, platform or even on the fiber um, um, connection. Um, similar with other companies, uh, PLD10 Smart or PLDT Group um, in general uh, is learning also on this pandemic. Well, what we can commit and what we're doing right now is we're again um, providing full support, not just on not just on various industries, but more so on the uh, consumer market, um, uh, more so on this pandemic. Um, uh, period, we can guarantee that our, our uh, connectivity, our connection will be as uh, stable and will be as fast or even faster as what we are experiencing right now. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, um, I think it's time. Uh, it's 3.03. Um, uh, we just wish that uh, there's still time to uh, discuss more um, topics, but uh, maybe uh, we could do another round. Uh, it was really interesting to uh, get insights and views of uh, different uh, representatives from our panels and from our speakers. Thank you for providing your um, opinions and thoughts and uh, views on uh, what's and, and sharing also on what's happening to your organization as well as uh, what do you think that uh, uh, company uh, companies that have to do to be able to slowly adapt and uh, recover from this pandemic uh, there you go ladies and gentlemen uh, i think our one hour is up to our esteemed roster of uh, presenters and panelists uh, Greg, uh, Miss Lilith, Sir Pedi. Uh, thank you. In, yep. Uh, in behalf of PLDT Enterprise, thank you all for spending this memorable afternoon with us. This was 